This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plan, celebrating 76 years of providing Tennesseans with high quality health coverage at affordable prices. Visit FBHP.com today to learn about our history in Tennessee and also to get a quote. That's FBHP.com. This is a special edition of the OTP honoring Oilers Week. These guys right here were all involved with the Tennessee Oilers as part of, was it the Oilers Radio Network? The Tennessee Oilers Radio, Radio Network. Network. The Tennessee Oilers Radio Network. Larry Stone, who was the executive producer of the Oilers Radio Network and then Titans Radio. Cody Allison, who was part of our broadcast team in 1998, became the sideline reporter for Titans Radio and went through 2014 in that role. And then a guy who's been in a variety of roles since 1997, mm -hmm. Rhett Bryan, who is now the executive producer of Titans Radio and Game Day host. But we were all involved in one way or the other. You were first, Larry Stone. How did you end up running the Oilers Radio Network? I got a call uh, in, uh, I was working with the Tar Heel Sports Network. We had just... Uh, finished up in the NCAA tournament and I was wrapping up the season and I get a call one day in Chapel Hill saying, understand you're moving uh, to Tennessee and we'd like to talk to you about the Tennessee Oilers. And my response was, what in the hell are the Tennessee Oilers? <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, that was the response of a lot of people initially. <laughs> I mean, I'd been kind of focused on, you know, college basketball and Coach Smith breaking Adolph Rupp's record, so I wasn't really in tune with that. And so, nice kinda, reference. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Kind of led one thing led to another, and three days later, I was interviewing at an outlet mall food court, which was a sign of things to come mm -hmm. of, of how uh, money would not be spent in this organization. <laughs> uh, and so, <laughs> and then two days later, I was in Nashville and got the job. And so, uh, I'll never forget meeting Rhett uh, the first day that I worked in the building, and of course. Uh, those who have lived in Nashville for a long time remember uh, WKDF, uh, WGFX Studios located on 2nd Avenue on the hill there. Um, walked into the radio station. There were two rock stations at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was the same day, you remember this? It was the same day that Frank Wycheck, Al Del Greco, Eddie George, and Bruce Coach, Fisher, Coach Fisher and Bruce Matthews yeah. came to town. And I said, okay, we need a tape recorder. And I got this look like, a what? <laughs> That's how far away they were from news and sports coverage at that time. There was no tape recorder in the building. And so that's, that's the ground floor from which we had to start was to go find Well, because recorder. Cody will remember this, because we were with Dick Broadcasting in Knoxville. Correct. And the, the two Nashville stations... So Dick Broadcasting was two stations in Nashville, two stations in Birmingham, two stations in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then two stations in Knoxville. That's right. Well, the two stations in Knoxville were the serious people. This was WIVK and WNOX, and we're very serious, we do everything. And then the two stations in Birmingham were newer. The two stations in Greensboro were fun because Alan Dick, the son of James A. Dick owned them, and, and that was his thing. And then the two stations in Nashville were your fun uncles. <laughs> if you wanted to see a show in Nashville, you called the KDF guys. If you wanted to do anything fun in Nashville, if you wanted you know, passes to Hermitage Landing, mm -hmm. you, you called the KDF guys. They were fun guys. So when we heard they were getting the rights, we're like, seriously? I know. We talked about it. Yeah. I mean, I'll never forget, we had this conversation. We're like, these people don't have any idea. Because <laughs> they played the rock and roll. And they were really good at it. But there was, was there anybody serious in the building? No, I was, <laughs> I was the sports. I mean, I was the most, uh, the biggest sports enthusiast <laughs> in the building. We didn't have a news And director. you were a jock. Yeah. What, did you, what shift did you work? Seven to midnight. Okay. John Justice. John That's Justice it. was your radio. That was when 104.5 was a rock station. Arrow. So there's a lot of people probably in Nashville that don't realize that. Yeah. That was its heritage. Yeah. Yeah.
Because it was Kix 104 when we were kids, That's and then right. Dick Broadcasting ended up with it. And then it became 104.5 The Fox, WGFX, and then it went to Arrow, all rock and roll oldies, and then it went through some other emanations before it became what is known as 104.5 The Zone. Yeah, the, all sports talk. Yeah. And you put that on the air. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago now? Something like okay, that. Okay, so... How did Red end? Up, how did Seven to Midnight Jock end up on the Oilers radio network? Because he was the only serious one in the building. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to deflate his balloon. That didn't really sound like a that was an a, endorsement, that was right? Very, he was, it was, that was very Larry S. Uh, that was no, but people, they, that's why people love working for you. Steve Larry. Dickert, uh, <laughs> who was the general manager at the time, said, "You know, this guy loves sports, and you know, I was going to school." in Knoxville and so we needed somebody to go to practice every day and again just that I mean that just tells you how small potatoes this was right. versus the NFL of today yeah right. I mean this was just a, here's Rhett the part-time jock going to do part-time work and go to practice three days a week uh, did you even get paid for that sure okay not a lot, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I didn't know if they even compensated you yeah, to go to practice. Yeah. So you would drive all the way out to Bellevue to mm -hmm. the practices. I would, yeah. And I would obviously go to TSU to training camp. And But yeah, it, that, that first day he's describing, we got uh, a Marantz cassette player with a wired mic, and I went to the Lowe's Vanderbilt Plaza Hotel. And so all of that unfolded with Mr. Adams and all the players he mentioned. and. Next thing you know, here we go. And I had no earthly idea how to cover an NFL team, but we kind of all kind of figured it out. And we together. had to. I mean, there was nothing, Mike. I mean, there was there was there was no equipment, there were no people. <laughs> there, I mean, there was nothing. And uh, in other words, I'm damn lucky to be sitting. Here. <laughs> well, no, but no, I, I'm not saying no, you. I'm saying point, how old are you at that point? Uh, Twenty-five. Okay, how old are you at that point? Twenty-seven. Okay. So there's, but, but um, I'm not saying anything about rep. There was nothing. I mean, there was nothing. There was no equipment ordered. Well, there was no plan. And they didn't know until June 1st that the team was even going to move. Right. That was the, that day mm -hmm. was partly a PR tour, but it was partly a, where are we going to tell our rest of our right. teammates to live? And then, then you find that, did you find out that day it was going to be Memphis? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, it was in the next two weeks that they find there was one more hurdle in Houston that they were going to try to get something done with the mayor of Houston, and they couldn't get that done. But the plan was that if they did not do that, that we were actually going to fly and do a Tennessee broadcast of the 97 team, which, of course, you did the pregame in 96 uh, of the Tennessee Oilers or the or the what Houston did they, Oilers Radio Network. This is the Houston Oilers Radio Network. And, and the, the NFL, NFL in Tennessee. Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, what, nine stations, I think? Most of those, I think, are still on the network. Still that on the network. The original. I own one of them. Yeah, that's it's right. Nice, so. You liked it so much you bought it. <laughs> I bought it. Yeah. I bought the company. You bought the company. Yes. The 97 season in Memphis, from the broadcast perspective, <laughs> Joe McConnell's play-by-play, Jeff Van Note's color. The great Jeff Van Note. The great Jeff Van Note. And you start off the first game, and you have prepared a pregame for Joe McConnell, longtime NFL announcer, ABA, NBA, Major League Baseball, college sports. Joe McConnell has all these skins on the wall, but you find out the first pregame show there's something Joe McConnell can't do. He can't read a script. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> God love, love it. Love Joe, but he could does not, this surprise you, he Cody? He could not no. read a script. No, you're right. He could not read a script. Great guy, but a great yeah. guy, but could not read a script. And but so, that's more typical for some broadcasters than what you would know. There are people who are serious readers, and then there are people who are absolutely not. And Joe, Joe is a great play-by-play -play announcer. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, when you heard his voice, you were like. This is big time. Well, you right. realized you'd heard his voice before. Sure. He was Walter the, Payton. Walter Payton, on, yeah. when he When he broke the rushing record with 103 fever in the flu and at Soldier Field as the Bears guy. Yeah. And he was, I mean, he's a great guy. We, we joke that he was the oldest living human ever, you know, just because <laughs> he carried himself as about 112 right. uh, with his demeanor. And but, in all actuality, it wasn't much north of where we are right now yeah. in age. And, but he seemed like he was... A server at the Last Supper, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was just such a, um, 
I, I think that in some ways uh, it, it livened him up a little bit to deal with yeah. all these young guys and yeah. even the year that you did color for him. I think I had, had an I spotted him. for him that year. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's right. the best story. How Cody <laughs> came to be the spotter in 1998. Do, do you want to start with where you were at that point? 1998. Finishing law school. You got another year of law school. Right. And somebody's dog died. Well, it was kind of... Do you Larry remember? Can I don't this. remember this part. So you know, go ahead. So knows Larry had, had set up someone to be a spot. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. And he was a really nice guy. And he had a breakup with a girlfriend. That's right, yeah. We were young, weren't we? We were very young. <laughs> he had a breakup with a girlfriend. And this breakup, there problematically for him meant that he had to, he couldn't leave Knoxville and the dogs that he had because at least one of the dogs was blind. So he called Larry and I mean it's how not How do you remember all that? Well, like, because I knew the dog because died, I re- but how do you remember? Well, I mean you can't forget that the guy <laughs> Larry comes to me and he goes, "Listen. <laughs> this is like something off Saturday night live." He comes to me and goes, "Listen, uh, <laughs> this, this poor guy, he's broken up with his girlfriend and his dog's blind so he can't spot anymore." And I'm like, what? I mean, can that be real? I mean, he's not blind. The dog is. Right, right. Yeah, that's I mean, right. I mean, the whole thing is. And, and been so, a great spotter, wouldn't he? So, so Larry's panicked because getting a spotter for Joe is no easy task. Joe is not an e- Joe's an old-fashioned broadcaster that everybody around him works for him. And you got to be on your game. You got to be on your game. And he, Larry asked me, he goes, "Do you know anybody?" And you told me that spring. Because you and I worked together in Knoxville. Right. And you left to go to law school in Mississippi. Right. And we saw each other that spring. I came, I came back on your old show. Okay. Yes. Before I left. Right. Before I left in Knoxville. Yeah. And you said, you know, I kind of miss doing sports. If there's anything I could ever do, let me know. Anything. So when Larry says, the poor guy is split up with his girlfriend and his dog's blind, <laughs> so he can't be the spotter anymore. Right. Do you know anybody? I go, I know a guy. Yeah. And Cody drove five hours each way, Mm -hmm. whether it was a home game or a road game, to be the spotter. And Joe absolutely loved Cody. It was like he was his long-lost cousin. Yes. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Grandson. Grandson? Do you think he knew you (laughs) prank called him? No. (laughs) (laughs) But we did use the prank call him. You did prank call him. I did. Yes. Do you feel any remorse over that whatsoever? No. None. Yes. Totally understand. And the statute of limitations is over. <laughs> it's so. totally run out. <laughs> but you would do it like on virtually every trip or right. yeah, yeah. call his room. The and- most classic that we won't tell the whole story about because it is inappropriate <laughs> came uh, in Seattle when your son when was Matthew born. When Matthew was born. I wasn't there. And so uh, they deployed me as the color analyst, which also shows you how of a small time operation we were. But uh, we called Joe on that trip <laughs> from uh, a sports radio station in Seattle. Yeah. And we spent the entire interview talking about the uniforms. And we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and Joe, Joe had no interest no, in the no, uniforms. No interest. He was very serious. But Zilch. I remember that. So Matthew was born on Friday. Of course, the game was in Seattle. And he is how old? Matthew? Yes. Mm-hmm. Almost 25. Okay. Wow. Just put it in perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew's almost 25. And so he was born on the day after Thanksgiving. The team had left that day for Seattle because Jeff, at that time, Jeff did two days mm-hmm. to the West Coast. So the game is happening. And Denard Walker gets in a collision at the, I think it was at the goal line. Wow, nice run. Playing in the Kingdom. Yes. And Denard Walker gets knocked out on the play. Well, Larry had been kind enough to have me on the pregame to share the news about my son with everybody, and obviously proud dad, and was proud to share that. So I'm listening to the broadcast at home in the den, and you guys don't know what's going on with Denard Walker. And it, it, I can ascertain that you can't see it. Well, I can see it on TV. So I call It was Larry. our spotter was the problem. Right, that's, <laughs> certainly that's true. He'd gotten up and left, gone to get a Coke or something. 
And so gone back down to the fish market. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I have the number to the booth because I'd been on the pregame show. So I call Larry and Larry's sitting there. He goes, what, you, what is it you want? I said, okay, Denard Walker, they're bringing the board out right now. And all of a sudden I hear Joe, they're bringing the board out right now. <laughs> and everything I'm saying I'm like, is going right on the air. And I'm like, this is fantastic. I mean, could have said anything and Joe would have said it at that point. But so I reported from my house, from my den. And my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm telling them what's going on. They can't see. Because um, that was the old kingdom. It was kingdom. crazy bad. We played there back to back years. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah, coming yeah. back from that trip, we hit, we hit the worst turbulence we ever had. I remember on that. a trip. Yep. Yes. Terrible turbulence, yep. and uh, I mean to the point that I mean the plane's doing this <laughs> coming over the Rockies, Seat and another on. member of our crew got upset because there wasn't any lettuce for his hamburger. And I'm like, <laughs> we're just worried about living right now. We'll be all right. We'll get you some lettuce here in a few minutes. Nice That's memory. Tough. I mean, if you're going to go down, you want to have lettuce. I understand. But I didn't care about lettuce, but <laughs> I, he did, obviously. So I didn't miss anything. No, you didn't. Uh, you missed the prank call. Okay, but we got to talk about, speaking of jokes, we got to tell a story, but first, I don't I even know where this is going, but you do know? I don't. Okay, well, you you're going to love where you it's will. going. I think I know where it's, it's going. It's always game on with Duncan, so grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before you watch the game at home. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time, which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. All right. So we get through 98. We finish the last game at Vanderbilt where they don't scrape the ice off the stands for the Minnesota game. 35 degrees at kickoff. Yes. Which was also the week that the Titans logo was unveiled. unveiled. We all went out for that. You and I went to Knoxville. We did. Where I were went you? To Tri City. You were in Tri Cities. Did you go out with the logo anywhere? Because uh, we unveiled it on that Tuesday. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. No. Week of Christmas. We did it. Uh, we did the logo in eight or nine different places and it was very successful mm -hmm. because larry and i and i think you went to the meeting at the lowe's on monday night yes that was fun it was fun because what was awesome is a guy came in and it felt like he had a briefcase chained to his wrist <laughs> and he really top did. secret it, but it was top secret top That's secret right. No, was, they locked the door, and they, they there were guards. Remember, there were guards, the guards at the door. And they said, you cannot get out. And they gave us hats and shirts that we were to put in our trunk. And uh, we went to Pilot. The Haslam's hosted us there. Correct. We were in Huntsville, Jackson, Memphis, uh, Bowling Green. Bowling Green, I remember. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was fun. And it got great coverage and was a fantastic and then the next day, we had one of the all, of all the years I've lived here, it's one of the worst ice storms that we've ever had. Remember, mm. I mean, it just sleeted for like yeah. a day and a half. Yeah, yep. we couldn't go anywhere. And, and so they never scraped Vanderbilt Stadium for no, the game against the Vikings. Well, because they didn't have any students in school at that point. They didn't have a game to play. And that was one of the issues with their situation because they're private school, they do things there, you know, for, for themselves, which is what, you know, they do. And yeah, people were falling down the steps and- Randy Moss didn't fall. He didn't Randy fall Moss, <laughs> I was just gonna say, you said they didn't scrape the seats. Randy and Moss. He scraped Darrell Lewis Ooh. for two touchdowns that day. So we real. lose 26 mm. to 16. Yep. Season's over, eight and eight again, come back, and everything is new and fresh and exciting. And we had the caravan and took Steve McNair out and it was unbelievable. And we took all kinds of players out and everybody was excited about the season. We go through the 99 season and it's 13 and three and we're all so young. I don't think we have any idea how good this is. No. I mean, we knew we were having a great time. Right, but you just couldn't appreciate it like you can now. No. Yeah. And you didn't, the thing that I look back on is that we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, I'm <laughs> serious. You did, Larry. No, I'm serious. No, we didn't because, <laughs> you know, you, we played in the wild card game, so we played the next week, mm -hmm. right. and that just felt like a regular game. And then everything that happened in that, and then you, then we're going to play Peyton Manning, 
And I, I still contend, you know, people say that it was the miracle or the Super Bowl that's what led people to really gravitate to the Titans. I still contend that it was about midway through that week when people in this state said, okay, yeah, I love Peyton Manning, but it's Peyton Manning or win and go to the championship game. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's win and go to the championship game. And that was kind of the, the change. But it just started happening so fast right. that we literally, we did not know what we were doing. Do you remember Rhett arriving at the hotel in Indianapolis? It's like a thousand people in the lobby. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was crazy. We went out to Shula's Steakhouse that night. Nice, yeah. And uh, there were people just everywhere. But how about when we got back home? Okay, to okay so go, go through Here's that story. story. What happened? You tell the story. <laughs> what happened when we got back home? Well, this is obviously pre-9-11, and, you know, we would go to gate B-4, Northwest Airlines, and we come back, and there must have been 10,000 people. Couldn't get down the escalator. Yeah. People there, were tripping, there, right, coming down the escalator. There was actually a lady that fell, I think. Yeah, and fell. And there was yeah. a, a medical <laughs> episode there, but there was 10,000 people in what was the old terminal, not 10,000 well, people they now. came on the, the PA on the airplane, and they told us. Right. They said there are 10,000. And he said it, matter of fact, he said, oh, the winds are out of the Northwest. <laughs> the winds are out of the Northwest. Hope you had a so, nice flight. Oh, so yeah. well, of course, your steak was good. Congratulations <laughs> on the 19 to 16 victory over Indianapolis. And there are 10,000 people inside the Nashville airport waiting on you. And they had to take us out in groups. I thought it was a joke. I mean, I did, I did too. I yeah. remember. I was right behind Yancey Thigpen, and I grabbed his full-length fur coat to hang on to him to get down the escalator. Was that really length. why, or did you just want to? No, it was a necessity. They I mean, were there close. Were people, there were people with people stacked on top of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was dangerous. And I remember... Some lady kissed Cody, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember... They were engaged I, I for a short time. Yeah, it was kind of another I story. I had a cell phone, and I had someone picking me up from everywhere. So Spencer George, who was a, a running mm -hmm. back yeah. from Rice, who was on the practice squad... Uh, I borrowed his phone to call uh, my ride to say, I, here's where I am, here's where I'm going to meet you. And it still, it took two hours to get out of the terminal parking lot. It was mm -hmm. one of the greatest feelings ever. Unbelievable. To walk, yeah. to, when, they, when they said, okay, this group can go, and you walked out and people were clapping for you like you were. It was so real at that point, like, wow. Well, and, and yeah. to think, I mean, everybody but me is in their 20s. And I'm just, I'm barely out of my You're 20s. barely. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's like, this is really <laughs> happening. And then you get sick. We still got to get back to the joke here in a minute, but let's continue. But then yeah, we'll you get, get back to the joke. Well, then, then I, you get sick. Yeah, I got really sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll never forget, we're, we went to, did we, correct me if I'm wrong, did we go to Jacksonville a day early? We did, we had to. Yeah. And we stayed at the PGA. Yes, the, the uh, Saint Saint Yeah. And I'll never forget going to Mike's room and I mean, he, he looked like... And this was day four. He's like the end of the world. I'm like, I don't know if he's going to make it or not. Well, so they gave me something when we landed on Friday. I was so sick. And I went to sleep for like 15 hours. I remember. And Cody yeah. says, well, let's go get something to eat. So I'm like, you know what? I think I could eat like a plain hamburger. <laughs> so I think I'm going to take another one of these pills that they've given me the night before because it makes me feel better. Bad idea. It was a really bad idea. Because at lunch, I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like all of ownership's coming by, <laughs> upper management's coming by, and they're thinking, the announcer guy's got to be drunk. We're pulling you out like weekend at Bernie's. Yeah, it's, We're like, <laughs> it was so bad. I had not eaten. Hi. <laughs> so when, when we called that game, I had not eaten in four days. We get back. And the thing happens at the stadium with 40,000 people, which was just crazy. Yeah. And then we go back to the office because we've got to get all the ticket stuff straight. And remember, there was, all, there was not two weeks. No. There was one week. I left the office at 4 a.m. having made plans with my family, with hotel, because we had to tell everybody everything. And then had to be back up at 8 o'clock. Yeah. Get ready to go. Get ready to go. And we left that afternoon. And then we get to Atlanta. Then guess who gets sick? <laughs> yep. Larry Stowe. Way to go, Larry. As sick as I've ever been as an adult. Really? And That's how I was the week before. And so you're thinking, 
I wonder when we'll get back to the Super Bowl so I can really experience this. But mm. part of what also made me sick, I don't know if you even know this part of the story, was at that time, Doug Matthews and I, the former UT defensive coordinator, we did the post-game show in Nashville. Yeah. And so we were on after the game. We stayed after. Uh, so here we are in Jacksonville, and they come in my ear and say, Steve Dickert has said to stay on the air until they get back to the stadium. Okay. All right. So I wonder what we're going to do. Well, we didn't have any problem. We took calls and I mean, there were, there were some interesting calls, you know, <laughs> as, as the alcohol <laughs> penetrated not all me. of the blood cells. Not me calling Joe McConnell. No, but no other, these are, yeah. these are folks who are really excited. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's Doug and I sitting in the press box in Jacksonville and it becomes an absolute monsoon. And we've all been there in Florida when it, that yeah. happens. But I mean raining like there's no tomorrow. And so I par we parked <laughs> all the way across <laughs> the stadium. So you can think of where the press box is. It was behind the other side another mile. So I had to walk through the rain at night to get mm. to, the, to the rental car. So that also contributed. I think you started it, and then that oh, it's contributed. My fault. Yes, it was <laughs> your fault. But yeah, I spent the entire week of the Super Bowl. I didn't get to meet Tina Turner. I mean, that was awesome, by the way. Yeah, right. Really well, but they, they did not come with us on the initial part of the trip, which is leading to the joke. Yeah. You right. guys had to drive down. So we did, and you our tell the story. statistician, the late Jim Curry, I had rented a four by four vehicle because there's this ice storm coming to Atlanta. And we're like, okay, probably need to head down <laughs> Thursday afternoon to make sure we get there. And, you know, yeah. here we go. Um, I had procured a <laughs> replica <laughs> Super Bowl 34 official coin like they were going to use in the coin toss. And we stopped at a McDonald's <laughs> in Ringgold, Georgia. And... I proceeded to, because this thing came in, it came in a little velvet it was bag official, with a drawstring. Yeah. yeah, it was a big deal. And the young lady that waited on us at the McDonald's, hey, what are y'all doing? Y'all, <laughs> well, we're on our way to the Super Bowl. Wow, that's really exciting. We're a little giddy at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so if we're in for fun and frivolity, it, it, yeah, we're doing this. I'm like, yeah, I uh, got a special assignment. Uh, we're here to deliver the official coin for the coin toss <laughs> for Super Bowl. 34. She was so excited. And her, she lit up like a Christmas tree. She stopped the whole restaurant. She goes, Y'all stop back there. Come here, come here. <laughs> so I get it out of the bag. Her eyes get even bigger. Um, and there is a picture that we can provide uh, yes. where Cody and I are well, with. Well, Cody's contributing to all of a this. A lot. Yeah. Well, he's, he's pumping the tires on the whole thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's full tail buggy. And so there is a photo of us and some very excited McDonald workers. Like 20 people I think or he's told her, crazy. like, I was going to flip it. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we went embellished. all the way. Yeah, we yeah. embellished. Yeah. We absolutely embellished. But um, yeah. that was fun. <laughs> and we had... Photographic evidence to prove it, but no McDonald's employee employees were hot or harmed in, in that. No, no, but they all <laughs> took a picture. In the making of, it. of this photo. But did yeah. they? Did you end up with free food out of it? No, no, we had to pay for it. <laughs> Larry, Larry paid for it. I paid. For it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good job, Larry. Thank you. But it was fun because they just they freaked out. They really, literally freaked yeah, out. Yeah. Did but, you guys but, know? I don't even know if I ever told you. Did you know that we were close to not doing the game? No. Uh, doesn't surprise me. Tell me that. We Let's were, hear it. We were close. I didn't even to, know that. No, the rights holder, Dick Broadcasting at the time, and, and you know, I think enough time has passed that we can tell the story, right? Sure. They were so concerned because the NFL charges mm -hmm. beyond what the rights holder pays the team, and they can only care the the flagship can carry the game. The network, the network could carry the. Pre-game pre -game. and the post-game. All six okay. hours of it. All six hours of it, but the, the flagship station is the only station that can originate a broadcast. So it's only going to be on in one place. So it's on in Nashville, and so the cost is significant, which mm -hmm. you would expect. And so they were like, I, I don't know if we're going to do this. And so it was up. It was in question of whether we were going to do the Jacksonville game up until Thursday uh, that we were leaving of whether we were even going to do it or not. And, and finally, 
saner minds prevailed, and we did it. I'm sure you had some influence. Well, I mean, did you have to throw a fit? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, why would we? I mean, it's. It was your <laughs> and truly result. enough, I mean, you come how many times have we been back? Well, twice. Yeah. 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 You know, we to went AFC to Championship Oakland. Games. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it doesn't happen. And, you know, it's not about the expense. It's about the doing it, and, you know, and we were we were making the point. Can you imagine what what the PR is going to be if we don't go do right. this ball game? And the NFL is so new right. in Nashville and Tennessee. Well, and, you know? and let's face it, too. The 97 year in Memphis didn't go great. No. The 98 year at Vanderbilt didn't go great. I mean, to see this thing this yeah. weekend. And to know how excited people are about wearing Oilers stuff. Right. And how excited that they are about seeing the team wear the Oilers uniforms that they wore in 1997 and 98 is so chilling to me because people hated it so much in 1997 and 98. care. Oh, they hated it. There's no oil in Tennessee. We need our own name. We need our own thing. And so... It's awesome now mm-hmm. that there's this 25 years and that people have become true NFL fans and they've bonded with this owner in this way that they feel so strongly about this. I mean, it's exciting, but man, it wasn't, it wasn't a sure thing. So the 99 season, I mean, you talk about timing. Wow. Well, and it was just, you know, I think that, um, I think that the things that went on in 97 and 98 – uh, you know, the every game was a road game in 97. Uh, you know, the, the the training at the pediatric clinic in Bellevue, <laughs> you know, they didn't have an indoor facility. Uh, that, that, that game, I, I didn't know this, and, and I don't, Jeff Fisher was telling me recently that they didn't practice the week before that Minnesota game hmm. because, remember, they didn't have an indoor facility. Right. Mm-hmm. So there was nowhere to practice. So they had to do walkthroughs in the ice. And I mean, you got to be thinking, you know, we can't have anybody fall or anything sure. like that. So just all the things that happened, I think, gave that 99 team a toughness. You know, they, they just had a mental toughness that, okay, we're down. We'll chip on their shoulder. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll get past it. You know, we get behind, eh, no big deal. We'll just... I, I, you know, that, and then there obviously was a lot of talent and, and the, the 99 draft with curse and, you know, McNair coming into his own. And, and so, but it was a, I mean, it was such an unbelievable story that, that they even made it there. And for us, it was so just, I mean, we were lucky. (laughs) I told Mike this recently, and I don't think he knew this, that, you know, it didn't hit me until we were coming back from the break, you know, halftime is 25 minutes in the Super Bowl. I had not prepared a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, what, are gonna, what are we going to do? Because that's one of the, the greatest things. Minutes? One of the greatest things about doing the NFL over doing college is the NFL halftime. It's now 13 minutes, mm-hmm. but that's also it's not an exact. It's really 12 minutes. Mm-hmm. The college halftime, you get both bands and you get the, I mean, oh gosh. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's fill, 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 fill. And the, the pro halftime is nothing. And now all of a sudden you've got double that. I blame it on the sickness. <laughs> is that what you <laughs> were? a lack of preparation. <laughs> but, you were always prepared. Well, but I wasn't prepared that day. I mean, and, I mean, there was, again, it, just back to what I said at the start of this, none of us were prepared. I mean, it no. just happened so quick. You know, if you'd had an extra week, maybe you kind of would have known a little bit better. But, I mean, it just – it was just boom, 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 and here you go. And I, I think in a way, though, everybody else was so new to it hmm. that it – I'm not talking about the football side. I'm talking about the people on our side – that it probably would have ended up messed up, that they'd have had us, you know, doing so much other stuff to promote or to whatever – because they were trying so hard to squeeze every ounce out of it. I mean, I went to Kroger at like every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, giving away tickets somewhere during the playoff run. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I understand doing that. But at the same time, it was like by the time we got to the AFC championship game week and I was sick, 
it's like, man, I need to be just prepared. And, and it was, but the, you know, that was part of being new. What's your favorite play mm. from those four playoff games? All right. I mean, other than the miracle, the miracle, okay. yeah, just, <laughs> but just put that out. I've got mine. I think it's probably the, the Derek Mason punt return. Oh my gosh. The, the, free, kick, the free kick return. Yep. It's actually a kickoff return technically. That's it. Because at the moment that happened, you know, they had outplayed us at, at the first half dramatically and they were only ahead 14 to 10. And the story is they had a scuffle in their locker room because the defensive players weren't happy with the offensive players. And our guys just went back out and we had their number. I mean, that team had their number and, and they were good and they were really good. I mean, to think about this, right. We shouldn't, I mean, I mean, you think, think about it. I mean, that that's a football team that went 15 and oh, right. except for the Titans. Right. That's crazy. Right. They were, I good. don't think that's happened since. Um, but I, I mean, it's just, it's nuts. And when he ran back that punt and we took the lead, it's like, we're going to win this game. And I, I had, been so sick, I hadn't considered winning. Mm -hmm. I thought we probably, you know, with Jacksonville, well, we'll beat them again. You know, even though everybody's picking against us and they're laughing at us and all this. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, we're actually going to go to the Super Bowl. And on the road. And I on mean, the road. And it's their coronation and we've just ruined it. And, you know, we've had it come back the other way. And so we know how it feels. But at that moment, it felt pretty good. Mm hmm. So that's yours too? Uh, for me, I mean, the, the Eddie 68 yard run in the divisional round in, oh, in Indianapolis. That's where he's looking up at the jumbo at the Tron, jumbo Tron, Tron and trying to see who's coming behind. Tyrone that's Poole's exactly chasing right. him. Because yep. that was when you're like, okay, this <laughs> this is, and, and people chanting in the RCA dome, Eddie, Eddie. I'm like, yeah. Great, yeah, great I'd memory. forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. they Eddie, had to call time out early in the ball game yeah. in their own stadium this because they is, couldn't uh, hear the signals. This is, this, I'm like this. This is big time. This is big time. And the other play in that game too is Terrence Wilkins runs back the punt, and Al Del Greco sees that he steps out of bounds at the start of the punt return. Jeff Fisher throws the flag, and the challenge is all new. Right. Of course, a challenge had gone for the Titans the week before against Buffalo. And sure enough, he had stepped out of bounds, and it cost them a 60-plus yard return. And it was on the Titans' sideline. Yeah, because I he's, remember because he's like right here. Pointing, mm -hmm. He and Steve Waterson were pointing mm -hmm. that, yeah, he had stepped out. Yeah. Yeah. It was a huge play. Yeah, well, What's yours? I love the Eddie run, but I also love uh, Steve's play in the Super Bowl. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know the play that mm. set up the final play. Yeah, uh, that when was Kevin just, Carter. That, that was, was just, Carter, right? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was another guy with him. They had him basically. He was had this him. far from the turf. They had him, and he, he just was did tough. vintage Steve. I mean, that's just vintage he? Steve. How many times did we see him do that? Unbelievable. And that's put, a great memory. It put the franchise so close to winning that game, or at least putting it in overtime. Man, it was a long ride back to the hotel after that loss. Losing well, there's, for multiple reasons. <laughs> remember? I do remember. We got stuck in traffic yeah. coming through Buckhead. Right. And we didn't know why. And then we found out later why. Right. With Mr. Lewis. The Ray Lewis incident. Yeah. I just remember being on the field and the confetti coming down. Do you remember what the song they played for nope. the Rams? I don't. Simply the best, Tina Turner. Okay, nice. She was, was she the halftime or was she the pregame? Pre she was pregame. Because that's pre when I freaked out. So who was halftime? Halftime was, uh, mm, this guy. I know who halftime was knows. at the AFC Championship game. LL Cool J. No, no, that was the one in 2003 at Okay. Oakland. It was right. Casey and the Sunshine Band. Yeah, really? <laughs> that's right. Wow. <laughs> so we're down at that point, and here's Casey and the Sunshine, and I'm finally able to eat just something. <laughs> I've eaten like a I've eaten like a bagel, a plain bagel or something. So I'm like, oh, I'm I'm energized, and that's the way. Uh huh. Uh, and you're like, okay. And then we go on to win. And so every time I hear one of their songs, I'm I'm very happy. Mm. LL Cool J was in Oakland. Right, he was in Oakland. I actually got to. That was when Pat Ryan goes, "Man, he's buff." <laughs> <laughs> and he was. I actually got to stand right next to him, and he actually, you know, kind of fist bumped. He was a cool dude. You got to be around a lot of people. Like I did. That. You know, 
just being down there on the field. And but yeah, LL, he was. I like him. Yeah, the ladies love Cool James. Right. And of course, I mean, you can't talk about that season without talking about you know the opener and you know the the, the way. I mean, the preseason opener and Jeff Fisher. I mean, they. You know, you talk about preseason football and nobody game plans. Man, they had a game oh. plan. They mm-hmm. were going to come out there and win that game. And they, you know, Faith Hill, right, was mm-hmm. she did the national anthem. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was just such an electric atmosphere. And it was, this is our stadium. You know, yeah. this, this is, we have a stadium. We Can have you a imagine home. what it's going to be like in the fall of 2027? No. When we open the new stadium and the comparison to... What happened when we opened the place in 1999 right. on September 12th, or actually in August? Well, I'll say this. Just coming back from Tottenham Hotspur, I've got a better idea mm-hmm. about it structurally. Yeah, that's the stadium. That pl- stadium plan, I won't say it's identical, but it's very similar. And I mean... And the footprint is sitting right in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, it's snug. It's crazy. Wow. All the parking is underneath the stadium. Hmm. You go by Bob's Your Uncle Fish and Chips there. There it is. And uh, (laughs) right there it is. It's it's a little, it comes on you a little bit like Lambeau Field does in Green Bay. With the Kmart. With the Kmart. (laughs) You're driving along. Only more snug. It's not wide open like that. You're driving along and you're in a city that is the size of Clarksville at the time. Clarksville's now bigger, by the way, than Green Bay. But you're driving along and you see the Kmart and then there's Lambeau Field. Because you're thinking it's like, you know, like in Clark Griswold when he sees the Christmas tree, you know, the light. <laughs> Here's Lambo when he sees Field, Wally World. right? Yeah. Uh, and there's a Kmart. Right. Lambo's great, by the way. You remember you guys sent me down to do a pregame there, and they have tailgates everywhere, cooking brats, and they hooked me up with six brats, brought them back up. My favorite Green, uh, Green Bay memory, which is totally off the 97, 98, 99 subject, is that we're there to set up for a preseason game. Remember that the Titans oh, and the Packers played good story. in the preseason every year, good which was story. great. That was such a such a fabulous preseason series because it's Green Bay and, and because it was, it was cool. It was 75 it degrees was so up nice. there. Yeah. Uh, but we're up in the booth and we're setting up and we've been up there and we've been up there. It's like, where, where is Mike and Cody? And they're, <laughs> and they're down sitting in Brett Favre's locker. Remember that was the, when they opened the remodel. They opened stadium. the remodel and there yeah. was an old guy. Yeah. And he looked like something out of a, out of a movie. Classic. And he's like wearing a hat and he's probably 80 years old and he walks with a little bit of a limp and he's smoking a filterless cigarette. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, filterless cigarette. <laughs> And, he, and he's like, would you guys like to see the place? And so he walks <laughs> us through where Paul Horning came out and where Brett Favre's locker is and all these things. And, you know, it's just we didn't have camera phones at that no, time. No, but he or, was in a cart. Didn't he take us around a cart? Maybe he but did. Then we got I just out, remember yeah. I just remember seeing all of it and understanding where Lombardi's office was. And I, I mean, that that history and. We had tapped into that years earlier. We made our first trip there in 98, which turned out to be Reggie White's final game with the Packers. It was snowing. And that produced one of the greatest pregame features in (laughs) Oilers Radio (laughs) Network history. Keep going. Because we'll – well, I tell you what, I need to to mention this about SeatGeek. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. If you haven't heard the name yet, get used to it because you'll be hearing it a lot more this season – whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or to any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Rhett? Where Titans fans can fan. Beautiful. Well done. All right. So, 98, December 22nd. December 22nd. Snowing. It was snowing. Yeah, it was, it was snowing. snowing. It was pretty hard. It was snowing. And we went down on the field in pregame yep. and acted like a couple of goofs. Right. Who was Well, because Who we're wouldn't? these guys. I mean, we never thought we'd be in Green Bay for all in the, the snow. In the snow, and you're. At I mean, it's perfect. It's it truly is the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. I mean, I, I literally had tears welling up in my eyes. I couldn't believe that I was lucky enough to be there. You yep. see this on TV for all these years, and we're actually there. And Larry has planned the most magical pregame feature 
He's a planner. Oh, he's a planner. And, and he's written something <laughs> just absolutely beautiful. Would you take it from here, Larry? So the line was something along the lines of, you know, you know that we, we should be above this and, and think of ourselves as journalists, but that it brings out the kid in you to look out and see the snow at Lambeau Field. Mm -hmm. It was great. And Joe McConnell says, I've been there, done that. <laughs> That was literally the comment. Shoot. Pop in the balloon. And that we was, all looked at him like, uh, uh, come on now. You, I guess you hadn't let him in on what the feel was sort of going to be. And he might not have he might not have gone along with it anyway. No. I was going to say, he might not have cared at all. But then Mike saved it because Mike said, well. I'm excited. I, I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. And, you know, and mm -hmm. so then I said, and so he said, well, and I ordered up for my guys. I ordered up this snowy weather, you know, and so. And so I said something, and again, he's called the Chicago Bears, oh, yeah. so he's, they've played Green Bay all these years, and he's called these other teams. And Did he call the Vikings? He did. Yeah, so, I mean, he's been to Lambeau Denver. Field a lot of time. So kind of the next thing was, you know, Joe, you have to have a lot of memories here, you know, and thinking we're going to get Walter <laughs> Payton or we're going to get the Purple People Eaters or something like that, and we get, you know, well, it was a, it was a <laughs> snowy November day, and... Green Bay was three and nine and Chicago was two and 10. And we kicked a five yard field goal with no time left to Final win score. six to three. Yeah. It was, it was just right. like Neil Armstrong's <laughs> second edition of the Bears were able to win here over Lindy and Fonte and the, and the Green Bay Packers. And you're going, really? That's really? The game? That's the, I mean, Bears Packers, if you don't realize it, they so hate each other. Oh, Ooh, oh they so. As ugly as any college football it, it rivalry. It is so nasty. UT it, Alabama. It's, yeah. it's, it's Raven Steelers, but with a much longer history. Right. It's beautiful. The, the hate, the venom oh, yeah. is just priceless. Generational. Yeah, generational. And yet Joe gives us. 6-3. 12-7 <laughs> with a blocked punt and oh, two safeties. Just, or so. I mean, just. Wow. But that was Joe. I mean, that was Joe. That's what, God bless him. He was just a, he, he just, he had, he just had that kind of surly, you know, which prepared us all for working with Pat Ryan the next year, <laughs> you know, because. Oh God, how many Pat I mean, stories do we have? He was positively delightful I mean, compared to. Woo. Speaking and of. And Jeff, Van, I have to say something about Jeff Van No, because okay. you guys didn't get the chance to, mm -hmm. to meet Jeff. Jeff was a classic San Francisco 60s flower child. Mm -hmm. I mean, just Mr. Laid Back, and yet you watch the NFL films of him just waylaying mm. people with block. I mean, he was a nasty One of the greatest player. Falcons 57. ever. Yeah. Uh, but Man, he was bitter about being replaced by me as the color analyst in 1998. Mm. Boy, that was, uh, I was very afraid was I would run into him at some point. Because I'm a I'm a diminutive man. I think, and, uh, I think you could take him, Mike. I, th so. I don't think I, I could take him in the car somewhere to get, to get a sandwich. I mean, there's no but way. What a great guy. He Jeff, was. Well, yeah. So we some, brought to up some the, of you. the bears uh, in this conversation. Okay. I want, I want to ask you a question because I was looking through a lot of the old game books yesterday in the '98 season. Do you remember? What happened at the end of the Chicago oh, percent game at Vanderbilt? And 100%. It was 25 years ago this week, as a matter of fact. 100% remember it because I, I have a reason to specifically remember it. First of all, Joe got a bit confused about what was going on because it was very confusing. So, end of the ball game, they can't get Al Del Greco on the field to try a field goal that, that would have tied, tied the game. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And they can't find him. And so the situation ended up being Craig Hendrick and Dave Craig ran out, tried the field goal, it was blocked. Titans, or I should say Oilers lose 24 to 21. 23 20. 23 20. Yeah. Well, so Joe's confused because he's like, what am I seeing? What's, what's happening here? And I've sort of got it because I've got, I, I say to him something to the effect of, they don't know where Del Greco is. Well, what had happened is Del Greco had been told on the sidelines that a play that had occurred two plays earlier was a first down. When in reality, it came up short and it was third down. Right. When they didn't make, he had gone back to the net 
to stay warm, which is what a kicker does. Sure. It was not on Al Del Greco at all. It right. should have never been blamed on Al Del Greco. But after the game ends, Floyd Reese is so angry. Of course, we're playing at Vanderbilt Stadium. There were <clears throat> screen doors, like on your back porch, in the Vanderbilt locker room that we were in. And I don't know why it was there. But Floyd Reese comes in and he takes that screen door and he slams it so hard it literally comes off the hinges. <laughs> I mean, it was absolutely crazy. Well, my wife's family is from just outside Chicago. My father-in-law and his wife are in town. We take them out to dinner afterwards and they are thrilled that the Bears have won. And, I, and I'm not. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, because I've just been traumatized by right. having to do. I did the postgame interviews mm. and I'm and I'm traumatized by what's happened and seeing Del Greco. I mean, it's just horrendous to see Al, one of the great guys of all sure. time and, and not his fault. I don't know if it's ever been fully pointed out that a coach had told him first down, we've got time. Right. And so he did what he was supposed to do. And so, you know, the whole thing, I mean, it's just awful. And then my in-laws are like, oh, this is so fantastic. <laughs> and, and I told my wife, I made it very clear. You're like, we need to tone this down I, a no, little no, bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> I said, if they ever want to see another game. <laughs> wow. If they ever want to have another meal, then we need to make sure we understand we're for this team. Right. You can, this is paying for the meal, This is baby. paying for the meal, baby. <laughs> this is paying the mortgage here. Oh, it was awful. Unless you want to take Michelle back. <laughs> and, and it was so funny because I was getting all the calls from our mutual friends in Knoxville. Right. Because they're busy winning the national championship. Sure. Everything's just fantastic. They're having the best time. And they're like, how's that going over at Vanderbilt? Y'all having fun? You know. And it was really kind of like, what are we seeing? You know, because there was some crazy stuff. Oh, there were that, some crazy moments year. at Vanderbilt yeah. through that oh. season. We talked about the ice on the Oh, on the, the ice at the end Christmas. of the season. Well, the first game. The Ryan, Ryan Leafs. September 6th. Or, yeah, was it was the greatest Chargers. quarterback of all time, Sep Ryan Leafs. Yeah, September. That was his best game. Yeah. yeah. I think it was his only win as a starter. Yeah, it was his best game. And he didn't even, I mean, he was terrible. And Natron Means carried like mm -hmm. 25 times yes. for 78 yards. Right. Uh, they beat us 13 to seven. It was awful. It was just a. It was an awful game, and it was the first ever game in Nashville. And we had done the, all those stickers everywhere. I'm there. September I am there. The 8th. September, whatever the date was. Yeah. I am there, and oh, it was just. It was an utter disaster. How about how about the the preseason game where the lights went That's out? That's right. The Forgot lights went out at Vanderbilt. Some, yeah, but that was was that 97. I thought that was in 97 that happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't remember. We played one preseason game in Vanderbilt in 97. Yeah. And it might we, have been that one. Then. Yeah, and that we was played, it. We played at Dallas. Uh, played, the Heath, last game. played Heath Shuler at Memphis, which was the handy Saints. to help draw a crowd because he was with the Saints at that point. Mm -hmm. And we played the Broncos in 98. And On they, the hottest day. But they ever. had to convince Mike Shanahan to play John Elway. He but, played like two snaps. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was he was out of there lickety split. But he was not going to play because everybody in Nashville is going, we're going to go see John Elway. And, and, and listen, every ad we ran is, John Elway and the Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure. a legend. And, you play. And, well, but I'm not sure that we knew <laughs> that he wouldn't play. We were so inexperienced. Well, again, this I don't is 98 think, right. when – Players I, play. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, we were Maybe so a quarter. We, right, but we were so inexperienced in promotion from the from our standpoint with the radio side and everything we did on this. A lot of the people who came from Houston were not inexperienced; they were professionals. Some of us, on the other hand, and so when we cut the spots, John Elway and the Broncos. We never crossed our mind John Elway wasn't going to play. <laughs> wasn't meant to be false advertising. <laughs> well, then, then. Shanahan comes out and goes, yeah, those nuttos over in Nashville, we're not playing John Elway. And so Fisher had to call Shanahan because they're friends. They're buds. Yeah. They're friends. Yeah. And he had to call Shanahan and say, listen, we need this. 
we need this bad. I mean, that's how I don't I don't want to say we were desperate, but well, that's we're trying the, to get going. That's yeah. the thing about Jeff Fisher that I will contend till the final day I'm on this earth that if it were not for Jeff Fisher, the chances of this team being successful here are low. You can make the case that he's the most important piece in all of it because he so got what we needed. So few coaches would have done all the things he did. He, I mean, he, who would have called Mike Shannon? I mean, can you imagine Mike Ditka or, I mean, the, you know, the people that were in the league at that time, Tom Coughlin. Oh, yeah. You know, Ditka, Bill Parcells was still in the league. Can you imagine them yeah. calling Mike Shanahan and saying, we need John Elway to we play? We need it. We need it because the crowd's expecting it. And, you know, it had been misstep after misstep. Right. And, and some of the things were mistakes. Some of them were just unfortunate, you know, things that happened. And the, the other part of it, too, was just not knowing the area. Sure. You know, not understanding the whole Nashville, Memphis thing, not understanding that Bowling Green was 60 miles away and that that was a great opportunity, and that Clarksville was close and that Huntsville was close. There's a lot of draw. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of draw. But the, you know, there were so many things that had to be pulled together to make it work. And Fisher was remarkable. And he was remarkable with us, too. Because, I mean, he, he must have thought meeting me, you know, hey, Harry High School, great to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Harry High School. Because, I mean, seriously, because all my experience was in college. Right. I had covered a quote-unquote big-time program. I'm not going to say I thought I knew what I was doing so much because I really didn't. But, I mean, he could have been absolutely awful to me well and he could have been awful to the fans oh sure i mean uh, because there were players who were dismissive of you know the, the fan base early on because they were pro guys and yeah they, you know well, i mean Jeff he's getting the questions big picture, he yeah. did because cody he got the questions were when are you going to change the name you know he didn't have anything to do with that we need to draft more vols yeah. you know why don't you draft why don't you be the pro vols i mean if i had a quarter for every time i heard that you know i can't I can't cheer for the Oilers or Titans because I'm a Vols fan. Yeah, well, well, not they don't, the same they thing. They don't play. Yeah. Uh, so, but he had to put up with all of that, and yet he's trying, you know, and he's a, he's worked. I mean, imagine you've worked and worked and worked to become an NFL head coach, and this is what you're saddled with? Well, and it started in 1995 at a preseason game that Cody in and Knoxville. I was at in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. Washington was playing Houston, and that's where the Tennessean dropped the report that Nashville and, and Metro was going to start negotiating, you know, exclusively to potentially move the team. He had to walk in the Marriott in downtown, Nash in downtown Knoxville and tell his team this report was going to come out. So for Jeff... All of this had been going on four years by the time he got to 1999. And he was gracious and he was magnanimous. If you saw him at Kroger, if you saw him at the gas station, he was kind. He was good to the media. He was very good to all of us that worked with him. Right. People have often wondered why we are all still so loyal to Jeff Fisher. And that's because when the world wasn't looking, he was good to us. Right. Well, it goes back to what Larry said earlier when we started this OTP. Um, he, is one, he is the catalyst of what you outlined with the roster building that had taken place. They played all these road games in 97 and, you know, they played in four different stadiums in four seasons. Crazy. They had no one else but each other. And so the cohesiveness grew from there. And then you make a pick like Javon Curse at pick 16 in the 99 <laughs> draft. You already had a young Steve and an Eddie, and those guys are coming in. He's clearly the catalyst that put all that together, and lightning was caught in a bottle, and here come the Titans. And he kept Mr. Adams involved enough and up-to-date enough. I mean, he did the right things with – and other people did too in the organization. But Jeff especially made Mr. Adams feel a part of it. Uh, he he made Mr. Adams' decision to move here certainly stand up, and just a just a class act. I will always contend that the three eight and eights. I think that's some of the most amazing coaching oh, that's gosh, ever been yeah. done in the NFL. Yeah, 
for, yeah. for the circumstances that they were going that were no going question. around. I mean, no the stories that we can't tell. <laughs> about what I mean, we've just skimmed we can't the surface. Say anything here? Well, you can. Yeah. Go <laughs> ahead. It'll, it'll be edited. No, uh-huh. It'll be Sorry. edited uh-huh. heavily. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that. And Mr. Adams, you know, I'm sure that till the day that he passed away, that so many people in Houston thought poorly of him. But here's what you can say about him: is he did not want to move. No. No. He was a Houston product. He loved the history, which is back to your point of how good it is to see the Titans fan base now feel about our Oilers history the way he did. That was why he fought so long to keep the name. That's why he wanted the baby blue still in the Titans uniforms. That's why he didn't want Earl Campbell's records and and, 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 and all, you know, all the other great Oilers, he did not want that history to go to Houston. It wasn't being petty. It was that that was his. That was his. He started the AFL with Lamar Hunt. And Paul Tagliabue and Jerry Richardson, then the owner of the Panthers, flew to Houston to sit down with him and said, you have to change the name, but here's what we will let you do. We will let you keep the history. And so for those who don't understand this today, particularly the folks in Houston, not not belittling, but that was an important part of the deal. The Oilers' name was never going to be in Houston. That was never going to be in play. And that's why the Oilers come to Nashville as part of the homecoming weekend now, because Amy has taken what her dad wanted and because of the momentum of history and time, has been able to build on it in a special way. Well, and let's be clear, too, to those in Houston. You got what Mr. Adams said he wanted. Right. Right? It took four years more, and you got it. Cost so, a billion dollars. So he was, he was right, whether you think he was right. Here's the other thing. And you guys live in Nashville, and I don't any longer. But when I was driving in today... Mike and I had the, the great fortune, one of the great moments of, of our work together was we took a trip to Houston before the 99 season, and we got to sit down with Mr. Adams. I never knew that. Uh, we got to tour his museum, <clears throat> and part of that trip, we were given the document that the NFL owners got about why this move would make sense. Hmm. And I never forget, you guys remember Paul Tagliabue was at the game, the San mm-hmm. Diego game, the Ryan Leaf yeah. crowning. Yeah, I remember game. that. You interviewed yep. him. Right? I interviewed him, and he said on the air, now can you imagine the current NFL commissioner saying this cool. on the air? He said this on the radio. Well, you know, we're not really sure this is going to work, but we got our fingers crossed. He said <laughs> that on the radio. But the forward-thinking people that were in the organization, everything that they predicted about Nashville and the Mid-South overall has come true. Has happened. And did you know when they started to uncover things looking at the stadium site, there was an original design for a second stadium to be built in the spot where the new stadium is going to be. Somebody in the mid-1990s had had the thought at some point, they're going to they're going to need another stadium, and that is the spot where the wow. new stadium will go. Mr. Adams, we got to wrap up. Mr. Adams was the only one who wanted Nashville. Everybody else wanted to go to Baltimore because it was better financial offer. He wanted Nashville because he was on the board of Cousin Plastics, which was a toy maker in Franklin. They used to sponsor our rival team in nine and ten year old baseball. <laughs> And so that was how I came to know the name. But he sat on the board, and he liked it here. He believed this was a place that could handle it, and he was proven right. And to see what his daughter's done now, uh, that makes it all the more special. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing story, and, and golly, it's just such a, a privilege to have been a part of it. Uh, Absolutely. When it was much different than it is now. Cody Allison, attorney at law, don't go prank call anybody. <laughs> Rhett Bryan from Titans Radio, the ever-reliable one in year 26. Thank you. And Larry Stone, the innovator of all of it. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having us. Proud of you and look forward to hearing you on the radio on Sunday again with us. It'll be fun. It'll be a great time.
Thanks for joining all of us for the OTP.